Good morning. I'm Anna Marie, and it's time for Focus. This is a closer look at resources we have right here in our own backyard. People, places, and things that you need to know about that might be able to help you and make your life better. Today, we're talking with Dr. Sichuan Bao. Now, what is your title officially so I don't mess it up? I'm an associate professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Mm-hmm. I am an adult endocrinologist. An adult endocrinologist. What does what do you do? What does that mean, and why is that important that we know about it? Yeah, so endocrinology, it's kind of a field where we deal with hormones. You know, all kinds of hormones: in the thyroid hormone, uh, insulin, the pituitary hormone, adrenal hormone. So endocrine cover a broad range of diseases. Mm-hmm. Majority would be diabetes. So oh. diabetes is a major you know, kind of component of endocrinology. Okay. And then thyroid, you know, adrenal gland and uh, pituitary, bone, those are all uh, in the endocrine field. I'm more a, quote, diabetologist. So I'm a general endocrinologist. I do general practice, but my focus is on uh, diabetes, in particular diabetes technology. Whoa, what does that mean? Yeah, so diabetes technology itself is a broad concept. Mainly, we deal with uh, glucose sensing, you know, how do people check their sugar, and about insulin delivery, how, you know, people take insulin if they need to be on insulin, you know, what what kind of insulin, and what are the formulation of the insulin. And we also deal with um, data, you know, the data from glucose, the data from those diabetes devices like insulin pumps or mm. continuous glucose monitoring system, or we call the CGM. And it's also about the data connectivity. You know, how do we get patients' data connected with their family or with their provider? You know, these days we actually do uh, telemedicine or e-visit or phone visit where patients don't need to come to our clinic. You know, we can get their diabetes data remotely and manage their diabetes um, remotely. Do you feel that it's possible more people are getting the help that they need and the medical treatment they need because we do have more ways for them to get to the treatment? Absolutely. So just speaking for diabetes per se, which is my you know, particular uh, uh, area uh, of interest, um, there are more advanced technology out there. So you'll see these days, you know, just talking about checking sugar, you know, I'm a kind of, I quote myself, an old doctor. But when I was in medical school, an we're old, still... You said an old doctor? Old doctor. I'm an old doctor. Yeah, like I said, being Vanderbilt for, just Vanderbilt being 20, 21 years. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but when I was in medical school, how we check glucose is actually collect patient's urine, put a little reagent, and then boil it in a test tube, and then look at the color change, and then say, oh, this is sugar is high, this is low... You know, and later we have these, they call the glucometer, where they have to prick the finger, you know, put on the strips, get the sugar reading. Has been generation, generations of these glucometer. The initially was like a huge, and now it's like tiny. But then we have these continuous glucose monitoring, uh, which has been around since early 2000. It's getting better and better and smaller and smaller. Literally, patient can monitor their sugar at home 24 hours a day, seven days a week without the need to prick their finger. And these CGM will be tracking their sugar every single minute and send the data to their, you know, either smartphone or for, for people who don't have smartphone, there are these kind of receiver, you know, a little mm-hmm. device, the data will go there. Mm-hmm. And the, it, the data can be remotely monitored. It can be shared with their partner, with their caregiver or, you know, school teacher for kids. So just talking about glucose monitoring, right. how much advanced it has been these days. What is a just, continuous glucose monitor? Is it like a, a bracelet or a ring or a... Yeah, it's a little disc. Uh, like, depend on which kind, you know, now they're CGM by small as a size of a penny. Oh. Literally, a tiny, tiny, it's like a, a called a sticker, almost like a little patch. Yeah, it, it sticks to your skin. Mm-hmm. And then it has a little tiny probe. I always tell patients, it's not a needle. It's just like a tip of the hair. Uh, it's soft. It doesn't really cause any pain. And that little probe can check your sugar and the send to the, you know, either the smartphone, which most people use for smartphone because they don't have to carry another. But we have our, you know, elderly Medicare patient who might not have a compatible smartphone or cannot deal with the phone or, or just can't afford a smartphone. There are also receiver or reader available that the data will go to the device. So if somebody has low blood sugar and they're 
their monitoring device mm-hmm. shows yeah. that, what, what do they have to do? Well, they have to act on it. So low sugar is sugar below 70. And then we always tell people you need to have some, you know, glucose tablet or uh, 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 candies and available so you can uh, treat it. A severe case, like below 50, 55, people is at risk for what we call hypoglycemia, syncope, or coma. They can literally kind of collapse, you know. Um, So, um, but that's old days, you know, people just don't know. Right. Um, But these days with the CGM, you know, they'll alert you even before your sugar gets low. It's called a predictive flow. Like it will tell you in the next next 20 minutes, you might get low. So you can even prepare ahead of time. So it's just much, much better. Yeah. Never drive with low sugar. So we always tell them to check your sugar, either do finger prick or um, look at your CGM data, especially people on the medicine that can cause. I mean, there are medications for diabetes that don't cause low sugar, mm-hmm. um, but there are certainly medication can cause low sugar, such as insulin or sulfonylurea. Um, you know. This is kind of a complicated question. So if it's, it's not an easy answer, maybe you can break it down a, a little bit for us. What is the importance of the the sugars in our blood what give us an idea why is that important and why is it so important that they're in a certain range yeah so sugar is a fuel you know it's a fuel like for any engine or machine you need the fuel to run so it's a so it's one of the three major fuel sources so we also have protein we also have fat and we have carbohydrate so these are the three fuel or energy resource uh, in your body Mm -hmm. and the glucose is a simple carbohydrate and there are also compound carbohydrate like starchy stuff that do not taste sweet but they are they're part of the carbohydrate that provide energy to your body and you need to have a homeostasis of your blood sugar for a normal fun- people to function because every organ use glucose you know mm-hmm. sh- or sugar especially your brain so if your sugar is too high or too low uh your brain won't function right and, of course, affect all other organs as well. You know, mm-hmm. if you have chronically uncontrolled diabetes where your sugars chronically run high, we all heard that you can run into the major diabetes complications, including the retinopathy, which is the eye damage, or nephropathy, which is the kidney damage, or neuropathy, which is the nerve damage. Wow. So, so we probably know, you know, diabetes is actually uh, number eight cause of death. And it's the number one cause of blindness, kidney failure, and the lower limb, you know, like amputation. Um, from the, no- the number one cause? Number one cause of the uh, blindness and the kidney failure and the, um, you know, amputation uh, of the lower extremity or toes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's from uncontrolled diabetes cancer. So it's very important to get the sugar under control. And that being said, you know, hypoglycemia or low sugar can also be dangerous because severe low sugar, your brain will stop working and you can collapse. And then, you know, certainly that can lead to severe consequence. You know, mm-hmm. there are people who had the car wreck or, or you know, um, just if nobody rescue mm-hmm. you or, or you didn't rescue yourself. Um, so yeah. that's why these Diabetes technology, the continuous glucose monitoring is so important for a diabetic patient who is on the diabetic medication that can cause low sugar. Again, there are medication for diabetes will not cause low sugar that right. only bring high sugar to normal, but not lower it to too low. Mm-hmm. But there are certainly medications that can cause low sugar. Are there particular people who are more susceptible to developing diabetes? Yeah, so diabetes, um, you know, the the cause of diabetes uh, is complicated. There's definitely genetic factor. You know, if you have a family history of diabetes, your parents got diabetes, you're definitely at much higher risk of having diabetes compared to people who's relative, you know, first degree don't have. And there are also environmental uh, uh, causes. You know, we're talking about poor lifestyle uh, sanitary, not active or not eat right, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, that is linked to other what we call component of metabolic syndrome, like obesity, hypertension, high blood pressure or high cholesterol. And all these are risk factor for cardiovascular uh, uh, event like a heart attack and stroke. And diabetes is just uh, getting more and more. So that's just the last 20 years, you know, uh, the number of people be- become diabetic has doubled. So at this point, there are like 37 million people in the U.S. are diabetic. And then 96 million 
have what we call the pre-diabetes. And uh, a lot of people don't even know they have diabetes. So one out of uh, five people that were diagnosed diabetes, they did not know they had diabetes. And one out of three people who had a pre-diabetes, they did not know they had pre-diabetes because they just you know, wasn't educated enough and didn't think about it mm-hmm. until somebody you know, checked their sugar or check a, a test called hemoglobin A1C, which is a very common test that we, we do, which reflect your average sugar over the past three months. So mm-hmm. I've heard people talking about, I need to get my A1C numbers down. Yes, yes, yeah. How does one detect the fact that they might be pre-diabetic? pre-diabetic? Yeah, so there are different ways to diagnose. First, you have to think about to test it, right? If right. you don't get tested, you'll never know you have diabetes or you have prediabetes because we often see people come to the hospital for other reasons, you know, say heart attack, and then was discovered they actually had diabetes that they never know. So to diagnose diabetes or prediabetes, there are different ways to diagnose. Uh, so we can do a fasting glucose measurement. Uh, just draw a fasting glucose. If it's below 100, that's normal. If it's over 126, that's a diagnosis of diabetes. And if it's between 100 and 126, that's prediabetes. So that's one way to diagnose. The second way is to use that A1C test um, where we just measure their A1C. So if it's A1C below 5.7, that's normal. If it's over 6.5, that's the diabetes diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And if it's between 5.7 and 6.5, that's prediabetes. Does prediabetes mean it's leading to it and will definitely happen? Uh, Not necessarily. If you, you know, really be aware of your prediabetes and act on it, you know, change your lifestyle, exercise. If you're overweight, lose weight. If you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you know, get those on to the normal range, and then you can prevent the progression from prediabetes to diabetes. But certainly if you don't care about it, and uh, then certainly if you're a prediabetic, your risk of diabetes is at least 50% higher than people who don't have. So if you don't act on it. If right. You find out, but, but if don't you, act. Right. But if you act on it, you can slow or uh, prevent the progression from prediabetes to diabetes. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Dr. Bao. She's an associate professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. We're talking specifically today about diabetes, but overall about endocrinology and the effects it has on the entire body. I think a lot of us were not taught how to eat right. We were taught we're in the South. We're going to eat this and we're going to put some butter in that. We're going to cook that in bacon grease and we're going to do this. I think we were not taught how to eat right. So now we reach adulthood and we're like, oh, crap, I have to change my ways. Where do I start? Yeah. Always have set a goal to begin with. Uh, You know, so talking about diabetic patient, the first thing is to watch the carb. We call it carbohydrate. You know, there is a simple carb, which is the sugary stuff. There is also compound carb, which is starchy stuff, you know, like rice, pasta, even they don't taste sweet, but it can raise your sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, so for diabetic, we always want them to watch their carbs. Don't overeat carbs. Carb, you know, will make your sugar high. Mm-hmm. So we typically tell people to eat l- l- no more than 40, 45 to 60 gram of carb each meal, mm-hmm. three meals a day. Which and, would be uh, about how much? About how big? Well, depend on what you eat. So I always tell patients, you know, their online source, there's uh, also a Calorie King book we often I uh, recommend patients to get it. It's, it's really about like 10 bucks uh, online version available too, which actually tell you exactly what food has how many carb, uh, how much calorie and uh, the fat content, the protein mm. content. Yeah. So depends. So um, you start from watching the total carb. I usually don't tell patients, oh, you can only eat this, not eat that. I actually tell them you can eat whatever you want. But it's the total carb that matters. So if you eat the food has high carb, you know, candies, <laughs> a Coke, then you can't have much of it, right? And right. then if you eat, you know, vegetable, which have very little carb, you can have a, tons of it. So um, and you can still eat whatever you like. It just monitor the total carb is very important. That is great. Yeah. So you just have to watch the total carb. But I don't tell them you can. You can never eat, you know, candy or can never eat ice cream. No, they can't. That's not realistic, is it? People can't do that. Absolutely. Yeah, impossible. Did you say Calorie King? Yeah. Is the name of the book? Yeah. And there's an app there, too. Um, just go to App Store, Google Play. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. By the way, I'm not doing any advertisement. Even no. I, I'm not, sometimes not specifically mentioned, but this is just 
yeah. a book that we often recommend to our patient. And there are also, you know, a lot of the online tools. Sometimes these days I just tell, sometimes the easy way, just get your phone out and say, ask Siri. You know, the other day, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I say, hey, Siri, what is the carb in a cup of blueberry? Immediately, 21 grams of carb. Yeah, and that's free, right? But okay. yeah, if that book just provides more complete, but there are a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, free stuff out there too. So just find a way to investigate. Exactly. Number one. Yeah. So if you have a high level of blood sugar, high level of sugar in your blood, and is it actually sugar? Glucose? It is, is. it actually sugar? It is glucose. So like yeah. if you tasted the blood, it would be sweet? If it's a high. So in ancient, in like initial way of people diagnosed diabetes. When you days, first started? First started, <laughs> I mean, be, before you and I all were born, like a thousand years ago maybe, uh, they actually use, you know, how they know is they see diabetic patients' urine track, you know, the ants. That's how first was kind of discovered uh, oh. why people have diabetic because I think it's like in e- ancient Egypt, before century even. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then later, you know, uh, they noticed, oh, you know, this this is sweet. And then they notice the urine was sweet then they start to think about it. maybe there are better way instead of you know track the ants maybe we should just see if there are chemicals that can can be measured that's how you know little by little people figure out how to check the urine it started with just to check the urine sugar yeah and later you know do the blood sugar you know from the pricking finger uh to to the um newer way that we talked about continuous glucose monitoring that's amazing it's amazing it yeah. is with a lot of what we're talking about we find that being overweight is an issue and it causes serious, uh, can cause serious health problems. What about thyroid issues? Because I've heard for years people say things like, well, I was overweight and I couldn't lose weight. And then they found out it was my thyroid. So what does that mean? Yeah. So thyroid disease is actually much, much easier to handle than diabetes, much, com- much less complicated. So when we talk about thyroid function, there's only three situations, normal thyroid function, overactive, or we call it a hyperthyroidism, or underactive, we call it a hypothyroidism. Okay. So if you have uncontrolled hypo or underactive thyroid, you can gain weight and you can lose in hair, you can have constipation, feel cold, tired, sleepiness. So uncontrolled hypo or underactive thyroid can cause weight gain. But when you are treated with thyroid hormone, you know, you talk about Synthroid or levothyroxine or other, um, you know, preparation of thyroid hormone, get your thyroid level become normal, mm-hmm. then your weight is no longer related to your thyroid. So what I've often found that people, you know, these days people like to Google, oh, I'm gaining weight. What, what, I, what do I have? And they'll say, you must have underactive thyroid. And they come to see me. We check their thyroid level. They're perfectly normal. So I have to say, yes, uncontrolled hypothyroidism can cause the weight gain, but not all the weight gain is saying you have hypothyroidism. So if your thyroid function were totally normal, you're gaining weight, you got to think about other things and do, don't just focus on your thyroid right. itself. What does the thyroid do? How do, how is it involved in your your whole body? It's it's another uh, important uh, organ that produce a very important hormone called the thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone include the T4 and the T3. You know, T4 is the storage version of the thyroid hormone and T3 is the active version of the thyroid hormone, but your body can convert T4 to T3 on its own. And it's involved, again, in the whole body's homeostasis. So if you have, you know, uncontrolled hyper or overactive thyroid, it can affect your heart, you know, heart rate will be fast. Mm-hmm. It can affect your blood pressure. Your, your blood pressure will be high. It can affect your bone. You could have, you know, more prone uh, risk for osteoporosis uh, or the, you know, the uh, weakening of the bone due to the low density. So it really affects every organ as well. Um, important hormone. And just like other hormone, we want it to be just right. Too much is not good. Too little is not good. Right. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, some people just want to lose weight and uh, they want to be overtreated with thyroid hormone because, you know, if you have uh, overtreated thyroid hormone, we call them itrogenic hyperthyroidism, means you have overactive from taking too much thyroid hormone. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're going to lose weight, but it can cause other consequences. Like I said, you know, risk of a cardiac arrhythmia, uh, uh, high blood pressure, or even a stroke, osteoporosis. So it's not good to overdose uh, yourself with thyroid hormone, even knowing higher dose can cause 
weight loss, but we can use thyroid hormone for for weight loss. loss. Well, all day some people use that, but you know they discover that's not the right way because you can die from it if it's your way overtreated. Okay, and you you use the word homeostasis. What does that mean? Your body it's is like a regular- balance. You know, you know, because these hormone, there's some of it is in your bloodstream, some is in your tissue, so some you know they're in different organs. Right. It all need to be balanced. It's just a, a yeah. medical terminology, like balanced. Yeah. Well balanced. It can be too high or too low. It need to be balanced. And so, does endo- endocrinology deal with the the places in our bodies that create hormones and and put them through our body? Exactly. We deal with the organ that produces these hormones. We also deal with the organ that was affected by these hormones. So, endocrine is just fascinating. We work with all kinds of hormone, and they all have what we call the feedback loop. So, talking about thyroid, you know, we measure a hormone called the TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. That's a hormone for your pituitary gland, which is a like a hierarch endocrine organ that control your downstream endocrine organ. And you so said your pituitary, like it's in your brain? It's a little gland in your brain, uh, and it's just behind your eye. It's it's very small, uh, tiny organ, but it's like the command, the central uh, commander for your other uh, downstream uh, organ, endocrine organ, like a thyroid, adrenal gland, or your reproductive organ, like, yeah. you know, testis, uh, testicle, or the ovary. So it's all uh, under the control of your pituitary gland. Oh, wow. So it's a nice feedback loop. So for instance, if you have uncontrolled hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid, your thyroid hormone level, the T4, T3, will be low, but that sends signal to your pituitary, uh, increase your TSH, which like, you know, send signal downstream to your thyroid again, say, hey, you got to work a little bit harder. And when that compensation mechanism is no longer be able to achieve, just like the, the sugar too, you know, if you have diabetes, your pancreas, which is an organ, produce insulin. In healthy body, is supposed to produce insulin to bring down your sugar. But when you know you keep kind of abuse yourself, you yeah. know, by just not paying attention to the risk factors, and then eventually your pancreas is gonna give up on you. For that's how people develop type two diabetes. Wow. Uh, it's from insulin resistance. It's type one diabetes because your body cannot produce insulin from the pancreas, so the treatment is insulin only. But type two, your body a- able to, but when you keep, you know, kind of boost your body, and then eventually your pancreas say, you know, I work hard enough, I just can't work anymore. I can't work hard anymore. That's when people develop the diabetes, type 2 diabetes. It's a mechanism is insulin resistance. I wish I had known you when you were going through school and learning these things because <laughs> you have this light in your eyes when you're like, this is fascinating. And I'm yeah, thinking, I'm a- yes, it is. <laughs> It's amazing. Yes, I, I love what I do. Yeah, this mm-hmm. especially all these hormones just make sense. You know, that's what I like in endocrinology is everything we call the feedback loop. Yeah. You know, the downstream doesn't work, the, the higher stream organ works harder and then kind of just the circle back and forth and try to keep the body's homeostasis. And of course, you know, when it's broken, we have to intervene. Patient have to intervene, doctor have to intervene to make it back to the track again. Do you notice, I'm sure, that there are all kinds of drugs and pills and miracle things on the market and available for people just to buy, just willy-nilly, just to buy, and this is going to help this, and this is going to help that. And it sounds like you're saying, bottom line, we need to act on having a healthy input of food and, what did you say, more activity? You cut, yeah. For definitely, if you're diabetic, you need to be active and uh, you need to, you know, if you're overweight, you need to lose weight. Mm-hmm. And just a healthy lifestyle, including diet and exercise alone, will prevent the risk of metabolic syndrome, which including the component of, you know, pre-diabetes, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I just heard the other day that obesity is becoming the leading, a leading contributor to cancer oh, in leading, our country. Yeah, it's a contributing factor to many things, not just the cancer, also the diabetes, the heart attack, the stroke, you name it. So it's just being overweight. Is that about hormones? Is it because you have a certain uh, amount of fat that it's helping your homo- hormones get out of whack, or does it have anything to do with it? Yeah, there are hormone involvement. Uh, there are hormones that make you more tend to gain weight or lose weight, but also environmental factors are also very important. Which you mean? know, like we have people, just the same people live in uh, one environment when they move to another environment where they pay less attention uh, to their lifestyle, and that can certainly, you know, aggravate the 
underlying causes. Oh. So it's not just you, there's a genetic factor. Yeah. There is also environmental factor that leading to the obesity or the diabetes or you know all the other metabolic component. So if you've if you move to a place where there's not as much access to fresh food and fresh vegetables uh-huh. and not as much opportunity to walk, is that what you mean by the environmental? Exactly. So metabolic yeah. disease is what the overarching title is. Yeah, we call metabolic syndrome, metabolic. which include different aspects of metabolic disease, including diabetes, prediabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and uh, obesity, overweight. And all those affect each other. So we... Like people come to see me for diabetes. I don't just look at their sugar. I also look at their blood pressure, look at their cholesterol, look at their weight, because one affect each other. One oh. thing get better, everything else get better. One thing get worse, everything else get worse. Whoa. So you need to treat the body as a whole, not just only focus on the sugar or only focus on blood pressure. You really need to treat them as a whole. Wow. So I often, you know, I will manage their blood pressure if it's a high, even they're not coming, refer to me for for blood pressure, but because that's important. It's a part of, Diabetes management is to get your blood pressure normal, get your cholesterol normal. So wow. we, we deal with all those. My husband has been dealing with high blood pressure most of his life, but I noticed that when we go to the doctor, the focus tends to be more on the blood pressure. And here's a medicine that can lower the blood pressure rather than you must get more exercise yeah. or you know that sort of thing. You must eat better, that kind of thing. It's more like here's the medicine that can take care I of you know. as you are right now. Yeah. Medicine is just the one component. Really, there is a lot of other components. You know, these days, everybody's busy. So just in that short period of a clinical visit time, yeah. doctors sometimes tend to focus on medication. Um, but mm. certainly other components are very, very important as well. We're talking environment, environmental or uh, lifestyle. We're talking today with Dr. Sichuan Bao, the associate, an associate professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, talking... Po- pretty much about diabetes, but about also endocrinology and how it affects our bodies. Is there, we're almost out of time. You've been so fantastic. Is there anything else that you would like to leave people with? Like anything I've neglected to ask that you're like, I think we need to say this. Well, I have to say, you know, because my focus is diabetes. So I still want to tell, you know, all the People who with diabetes or don't have diabetes, a be aware of the diabetes uh, pandemic, and uh, really, you know, if you notice uh, you're uh, you're overweight or uh, or you have you know a uh, habit of like smoking or drink alcohol excessively, all those are all risk factors. So mm-hmm. you need to be aware of the situation and uh, get diagnosed and get treated, and also. Um, work on it and, uh, you know, and set a realistic goal just for like for obesity. You know, your, your goal is to not lose 50 pounds in a month. So we want a sustainable, gradual way. And uh, the tools out there, there are more medications available. There are more, uh, uh, you know, technology available for all kinds of, you know, especially diabetes field, you know, all these fancy uh, continuous glucose monitoring, uh, insulin pump. So I didn't talk about chance to talk of insulin pump. Right. So people with type 1 diabetes, we have all these insulin, you know, now there are like a four kinds available. We call them artificial pancreas or closed loop system where they can auto-regulate like acting like a, a pancreas. So if your sugars are high, it will give you more insulin on its own. If your sugars are low, give you less insulin. If your sugars, you know, Low, below 70, it will actually shut off the insulin delivery. So yeah. we call them artificial pancreas. It's all out there. So really revolutionize the care for, for diabetes. So be aware of those. And sometime, you know, open to go to the uh, website, not just read everything on the, on the uh, media, Google. Yeah. If you want to read something, you go to the official recommended site, say diabetes, you know, you have diabetes, you want to go to American Diabetes Association website, right. rather than just uh, all kinds of stuff. And talking about supplement, you just mentioned sometimes people say, oh, I take this, I took that. So all those supplements are not studied or approved by FDA. So uh, not always, um, you know, reliable source to self-treat. So mm-hmm. uh, sometimes you see people taking a bag of stuff, say, oh, this somebody told me this is good for my sugar, this is good for my blood pressure. Be careful of those uh, supplements. If you truly have the disease, you really need a uh, uh, right treatment, which, which means, you know, uh, 
FDA approved medication prescribed by your doctor rather than just taking a bunch of supplement that you don't really know uh, what they can do to you or what interaction they have. Because sometimes you think this is good, that is good, but to add it together may not be, you know, right. good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Bell. If you want links to more information, we're going to put those on our Focus Facebook page. Thank you to Dr. <laughs> Bao for joining us today. I'm Anna Marie, and that's Focus.